There's a battle that rages at this moment, right now. You can't see it with the visible eye, but it rages nonetheless between Satan and Christ, between wickedness and holiness. And that battle is raging. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus came into this world, went to the cross, and at the Titleist that was nailed over the top of his head, he took that Titleist, which was the charges brought against him, and the scripture says that he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In the cross at Calvary, he died in weakness, and by the kind of death that he died, becoming sin for us who knew no sin, there is no more accusation that anything can bring against God if it comes to the cross. If you bring it to the cross at Calvary, whatever accusation, charges, Satan lays at your step, whatever he lays on you to try to condemn you, whatever he tries to do to you to tear you down or break you apart, if you take him to the cross, he can't go any further because there God justified himself and his relationship with man. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the right, their, sin, their sins unto them or their trespasses, but he hath committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. Now there's a whole lot going on here because no sins were ever really forgiven of an Old Testament saint. They were pushed forward to the day when the Lord Jesus made the blood covenant and the blood covenant of Christ's blood is the only thing that can wash sin away. Revelation 1, 5, the apostle says in the book of Hebrews, by the blood of bulls and goats, you cannot wash sin away. So what did they do? They pushed it forward. And so on the day of Pentecost, when the apostle Peter got up to preach, he got up to preach and he talked about the, Christ, the death that Christ had died, the sacrifice that he made. And he said he died for the remission of sins. And that Acts chapter number two, verse number 38, talking about the remission of sins, is talking about the sins that had happened in the past, how that now the sin debt had been paid and it was wiped clean. And the Bible says that he died for the sins which were under the former or the previous generation or the previous covenant. And when he went to the cross, he paid for all of that. So David introduces a very powerful thing here in the 51st Psalm. Because he says in Psalm chapter number 51, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And my, 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 when God judged me, found me guilty and said I was worthy of hell, was he just in doing that? Yes. So when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary and died what we call an expiatory death, in other words, a substitutionary death, when he took the place of someone else on the cross, then God justified his holiness in what Christ did for us, paying my sin debt. When a man goes to hell, he's not paying for his sins. When a man goes, his sins were paid for at the cross. When a man goes to hell, he goes to hell because of unbelief, because he rejects the sin sacrifice, the only sin sacrifice that has ever been made for the, for the sins of mankind. God will be judged one day, but you can be certain of this. That holy, righteous, absolute, eternal being will come forth as the holy, righteous, absolute, eternal being he ever has been and ever will be. And not one taint of his will, not one taint in his purpose, what not one taint in his being will ever be found. He is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Abraham said, I am but dust of the earth, dust and ashes. And he said, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? He will. He'll do right. Whether I've got it figured out or not makes no difference. The judge of the whole earth will do right. Notice carefully that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So he's the only one qualified to make an absolute judgment as it relates to sin and your relationship with God. Only God knows the motive. Only God knows the weakness. Only God knows where you started from. Only God understands these things about every single lap, every one of us. It makes no difference who we are. He knows us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, and he can judge righteous judgment. Now, this brother mentioned just a moment ago that three preachers were instrumental in his salvation. So what's that say? That says that it was a process. That says that it took time. That says one sold another water and God give the increase. That meant that these messengers of God, God used, but it also says this. It says he was on a journey. It says it took him a while to come to saving faith. Saving faith is a big deal because once saving faith ever settles into your soul, 
You are changed from a child of hell to a child of God. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not the same as you were. You'll never be the same again because of saving faith. We need to tell people about the Lord. We need to witness to them. Witnessing to people about the Lord is a, is, is, is a privilege and a blessing to us. And I pray that if our life is right with God, that's what we want to do. We want to tell people about the Lord. But don't ever reduce salvation into a sideshow and a con artist thing where you've got people that you're convincing them just because they prayed some prayer that they're okay now and they're saved. You don't need anybody to convince you. Once you are truly born again, the Holy Ghost will bear witness in your soul that you're born again. You don't need anybody to convince you that you're saved. But the sad thing is that the church has been filled full of people that have been through that mill and they're nothing in the world more than a religious sideshow so that people can brag and boast about uh, all that they've led to the Lord. The blood covenant, the blood atonement of Christ is for all mankind. Folks, there's only one atonement. There's only one blood covenant. There's only one blood covenant that can wash the sins of man away. And it is the blood covenant of Calvary. And that's what the Lord Jesus did and accomplished when he was here. And when he said it is finished, that's what he meant. It's finished. And the apostle in the book of Hebrews says he offered one sacrifice for sin forever. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Finished. Complete. It's over. It's finished. It's done with. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of these gospels. You know, they teach in college and Bible colleges and Bible institutes that they're the synoptic gospels. That means they've got one view of the, of the life of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are always talking about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. But when you get to the gospel of John, it is entirely different. It's a completely different focus. The gospel of John is not about the Jewish kingdom. It's not even really so much about the Jews, although they're mentioned a number of times. It's about whosoever's going to believe. John said, these things are written that you might believe. So here's what all that means. It means that once Israel had rejected the Messiah, had been blinded, according to Romans chapter 11, the focus of the ministry of the gospel is no longer to a Jewish nation or the Jewish people. It's to everybody. It's to all mankind. It's to all of us. So when John writes 1 John, he's writing to believers in the first century after Christ. In other words, all the way up to 100 AD, he's writing to believers. And here's what he says to them. 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, do not the truth. Let him define darkness for you. Darkness comes in a lot of different ways. But what John's talking about here is understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you will acknowledge that work and agree with what the Holy Ghost is doing in your life, you won't walk in darkness. Here in 1 John, look carefully. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie, do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's the blood covenant. Now look at verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John says, if you're going to walk in the light, you're going to walk in the acknowledging of the work of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is going to say to you, you are not perfect. All right, now watch the next move. If we say we have no sin, we self-deceive. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Watch this now, three of them here. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's a powerful thing. If you want the Christian life, in a nutshell, condensed to three verses, like the 51st Psalm of the Old Testament condenses and brings together the Old Testament believer. Now, does anybody have any problem with the 51st Psalm? That's a wonderful Psalm, right? If you walk according to the 51st Psalm, you're in good shape. Now, here's the problem. There's nothing in the 51st Psalm about Christ going to the cross and dying, shedding his blood, and the blood covenant that we're under now. But this is an Old Testament saint looking forward to the promise and the coming of the Redeemer and the Messiah. The Messiah. Now John is looking back to the cross and he's telling you, do you want to live a Christian life? Do you want to walk in fellowship with God? Do you want light in your life and not darkness? Then he says there are three things that you acknowledge. And if you look at them the way the Bible says to look at them, then you can walk in fellowship. Notice that sin is the issue, not perfection. You have people around, and they, they were big on this a couple of hundred years ago. Now, some of them even taught that you could live a sinless life and that the, that the sinless life was proof positive of sanctification. 
and that a person had withdrawn themselves so far from the world that now they were living a perfect, sinless life. No sin. Now think about that for a minute. The Apostle John comes along and he tears that all to pieces. He said, if we say we have no sin. So what does that mean, preacher? It means this. My life should not be about me becoming a better, more righteous, spiritual person within myself. My life should be about the Lord Jesus Christ and my comprehension and understanding of Him to become better and greater and more wonderful, that He has made it to me righteousness, that He is the one who gives me the cleansing that I need through His work and His blood. For me to walk the Christian walk, the Apostle Paul says, Christ must be formed in you. Christ being formed in you is not the salvation of your soul. That's not in other words when you were born again. Christ being formed in you is the work of the Holy Ghost that takes place after you have been born again. Christ is formed in you. Christ is all to you, less of you and more of Him. I firmly believe that the individual that's walking in light, walking in fellowship, and walking where they should be walking with God, you talk to that individual. They don't have to tell you. You can sense the Spirit. It's not about them. It's about Christ. They're consumed with Him. They love Him. They sing about Him. They pray to Him. They preach about Him. They talk about Him. He's their Savior, their Lord, their God, their Master, the forgiver of their sins, the Redeemer. He's the one who's everything to them that they themselves could never be to themselves. You could never be what He is to you. He's everything that you need. Would you take a Pharisee? I thank thee, Lord, I'm not as other men. I fast, I tithe, see all the eyes. But the old publican would not even so much as lift his head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner discover after your initial salvation the Lord that your comprehension of sin will get deeper your perception of spiritual things will become greater your understanding of rebellion will be your sense about it will be sharper you'll be able to see things that you couldn't see immediately when you first got saved if you ever start getting that growth in Christ where Christ is formed in you you don't want to be bragged on it's not about you and what you've accomplished without him we can do nothing John 15, he said, I'm the vine with the branches. You get whacked off from him. You let the Holy Ghost withdraw from you for a while. He'll never leave you. But you let him pull his power back away, his unction back away from you, that anointing back away from you. And I guarantee you, you'll be twice dead and plucked up by the roots just like that. And you'll find out how great you are. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is to us. And here's what you'll notice. You'll notice humility. You'll notice a love in that person. You'll notice that that person is not about themselves and their accomplishments and the crowd they run with, the church they belong to, and the circles that they're here, and the, and the great Christian celebrity names that they can toss around and all this stuff. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we've got to have today. He's made a simple statement. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. As Moses lifted up the servant of the wilderness, he was so much the son of man be lifted up. All right. He was lifted up at the cross, but you can lift him up in your preaching, and you can lift him up in your life. You can lift him up when people see Christ in you. The Bible says Christ in us is the hope of glory, right? There's nothing that repels another human being than to see pride and arrogance, self-love, and all the rest of that inside another human being. But what draws you to other people is courage, sacrifice, love, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering. That draws you to them, doesn't it? I keep thinking about those little girls over there in Iraq. They were probably Syrian Orthodox. They were Christians. And the Muslims murdered them. But before they died, the Muslims said, we're going to give you this opportunity to become a Muslim. That's the way Islam promotes itself with a sword. We'll, give, we'll let you, we'll give you an opportunity. They said, no, no, no. Jesus has been our Savior all of our life. Just little kids. No, we're not going to turn on him now. Knowing they were about to die, that's courage. Remember what I said to you the other day about these preachers in America? Scared to death that they'll lose their, their 5013C or whatever it is with the government. And so their political correctness has shut them up and they won't speak anymore. We don't need it. We don't need the, We don't need Caesar. We got everything we need in Christ. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you bless us. Word, study up tonight. Bless it to the hearts of the people that heard it. Maybe somebody heard this tonight. Father, they've been going through this Bible. They've prayed the sinner's prayer a dozen times. And nothing's changed. And they think it's it's futile and it's a waste of time. I pray that they'd understand, Lord, that they're not the only one that's been through something like that. A lot of people have been through something like that. But a lot of people, Lord, have a journey to God. It's not an easy thing for them. And I pray for them tonight. I pray for them. Maybe this will encourage them. You're there. And I don't know what the issue is, but you're there. You've always been there love them and you'll save them. And I pray for them in Jesus' name. 
there's somebody in this house tonight who they've done something they just don't feel like they can get forgiveness for it or maybe they've been forgiven and they can't forgive themselves whatever they're wrestling with I bring that before you in Jesus name I pray for them for thy name's sake we ask it